I hope you're having a good evening uh, with fellowship and eating snacks or food with one another and ready to study the Word of God together. I have uh, some notes uh, here on my iPad that you should have copies of those there. And so what I'm going to teach on tonight will, will correspond to the notes. And really the principles that I'm going to try to show you in this, uh, in this video, uh, I want you to try to go ahead and apply within your group. So you're actually going to study through some scripture together um, tonight that your uh, leaders will lead you in. And you're going to try to apply the things that we're going to talk about now. So uh, where we're at is we're studying the trellis and the vine still and so we're looking at vine ministry so again just a reminder there the trellis ministry is kind of the support ministries that go along that help make a way for the vine ministry to take place and last week you should have covered just what different vine ministries look like there's uh, kind of one-on-one -on -one vine ministry or small groups or large groups wherever the word of god is going out those that would be vine ministry and so hopefully you're able to uh, discuss some of that and maybe even do some of that this week uh, but what we want to focus in on today is actually uh, vine ministry. So number one, in your own life, what does it look like to have uh, the word in your own life? And so I'm going to talk about actually some principles and ideas of uh, your quiet time, uh, self-feeding, if you will, or your private devotions. I, guys, I really think that uh, many of us struggle with this. And so I want to speak to that. But then also those same principles help you to apply those to when you're studying in a small group or with just a couple of other people uh, because they're, they're going to be very similar some of the things that we do there and so hopefully this will help equip you so that way when you're studying the word yourself that vine ministry is happening in your own soul but also when you are meeting with other people so that, that's the plan for this evening so let me let me just begin with saying this if you are not intentional with setting time for vine work, for the word of God in your own life and with other people, then most of the time, pretty much it's not going to happen. Now, why is that? Well, the, the, the reason is because the, the world is busy and things are chaotic and Satan is against you and the enemy is constantly coming and there's always something else to do. And really, if we, if we take Jesus' word seriously when he says that, again, we, that we're not to live on bread alone, but we live off of the, the, the words that come from God. Well, that's, if that's really where our life comes from, then this has to be top priority. We have to be intentional to set time aside. If it's, well, I need to work out, uh, exercise, or read the Word of God, have the Word of God in my, you know, my quiet time, my devotion, that has to take precedent. Uh, whatever else is going on in your life, you have to be intentional to make time for. And hopefully you're going to have some people, and even in your groups or other people in your life, who are going to help keep you accountable for that. Hey, how's it going with that, that, that word ministry in your own life? Likewise, we need it with one another to grow. That's how God has designed it. So, um, number one, you have to be intentional. You have to be focused on it. Uh, a couple other things, and again, you have your notes here, but, but part of what I would say is the way you begin, so, so what you do is you have your, your scriptures, and um, you, you know, don't just, I, I would encourage you to, to not just kind of listen as you're going through or, or wait to, uh, you know, a Bible verse to come on the radio or something of that nature, but be intentional and make time and sit down with God's word. Some people use iPads, iPhones, or just the scriptures themselves. Uh, and, and, but I would encourage you to, to take time to be in the Bible and read it. Now, I know some of us are we're not good readers or whatever, but that's okay. Start small, start simple. In addition, as a supplement, it's good to listen to the Bible, and that's why we have the Dwell app, and I hope that you're using that. And if you, you really can't, if there's no way for you to sit down and read the Bible that day, well, then listening is certainly better than, than doing nothing. But the idea is that it would be both. So you could actually listen while you're reading, listen along, so that may be helpful for you, uh, or just have your time of reading and then uh, listen in the car or other places. Um, but before you start, let me encourage you to do this. Pray. And what I mean is, again, we know that the Holy Spirit is the one who has inspired the scriptures, right? He's, he's the one who inspired the authors to write down the very, the very words of God, the word of God. And so if the Holy Spirit's the one who, who helped inspire, well, then we would want to ask for the Holy Spirit to help to illuminate, to, to open our eyes and our minds and our hearts to understand the scriptures. So the, the first thing would be cry out to God before you ever start. God, I know that I need your word. I know that it, I need it inside of me to make me look more like Jesus, and I have trouble understanding it, God. But would you please, Holy Spirit, speak to me. Help me to understand this today. Help me understand what it is in this passage that you have for me today. And then, Holy Spirit, help me apply it to my, to my life today and, and use it in my life today. If there's certain words that you've given me today for my own soul or that I need to share with somebody else, uh, Lord, lead me in that. I want to be faithful. So... 
So, so start and, and just really view it and remembering, okay, there's the, the human authors throughout the scriptures, uh, but there's also the divine author, and it's, it's the word of God, it's living and active, and I have a, a bunch of verses on uh, the notes for you here that I, I, want you, I want to read through with you and go through because I believe they're helpful in thinking about what the, what the scriptures are. But when you, when you look at it, when you're about to read or listen, kind of view that as a letter or a text from God to you that moment that day. So if, if your wife or your husband or your friend or whatever, if they text you, it's because they're trying to communicate something to you uh, that you need to know. Well, God wants to communicate to you what you need for that day. And so that's really when you're going in, be like, oh, well, this some, these are just some stories or this is just something that, that happened long ago. But really, God, what is it that you're going to teach me today? Let me read, follow along on your notes there. Let me read a couple of uh, just passages for you. 2 Peter 1, 16 through 21. Uh, Peter says this, For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses to his majesty. And when he received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son with whom I am pleased. We ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. And we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed, to which you will do well to pay attention. Look at, focus on, pay attention. Don't just let it go quickly. Put your attention on it. As a lamp shining in a dark place until the day draws and the morning star rises in your hearts. Knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So big point there. Men wrote it, but they were carried along by the Holy Spirit, and it is the sure word. 2 Timothy 3, uh, 14 uh, through 4, 1 here, or through 17, sorry. Uh, but as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from a childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, meaning the scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture, all of it, Old Testament, New Testament, is breathed out by God, so God's very breath and profitable for teaching and for reproof and for correction and training in righteousness that the man of God may be co complete, equipped for every good work. Okay, so he's saying that every good work that you could possibly have uh, or possibly need, the word of God will give that to you. It will equip you to do that. So we're, again, we're believing it's written by the Holy Spirit, by both man, but also uh, ultimately written by God, the Holy Spirit. It's the very breath of God and given for everything that you need for righteousness and salvation and growing in Christ. But now Hebrews 4, 12 and 13 says this, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature, look at this, is hidden from its sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him whom we must give an account. So the word of God, it, written by, again by the, the Spirit, and um, but carried along, men carried along by the Spirit wrote it. But it is living, it's active, it's the very breath of God. And so here that means it cuts deep into our soul. It cuts to the heart. It cuts to the quick, if you will. And it goes all the way inside of us and it searches us in a way that nothing else can. The Spirit uses the word and it pierces and cuts deep and searches us. But it's living and active. And so it's, it's timeless. It's always, it's always relevant. So that means God uses it to always be timely in your life. So again, this is why the idea of this kind of text or letter or whatever is coming from God for you in that moment. Uh, Psalm 119.105, your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light into my path. Okay, so picturing the word of God, God, what you have for me today is, is a light to my path. It's, it's a lamp for me to see. This is what I'm saying. You need to be praying these things, thinking these things um, before you even get into the word. Be saying, okay, Lord, I need your word to be a light. I need, uh, I need your, your living and active word to cut me deep and show me what's going on in my heart. Uh, we need to be saying these things and thinking these things um, and praying these things before we ever jump in. Uh, James 1, 22 through 25 uh, talks about uh, being not just hearers of the word, but actually doers. So this word gets into application. So even when you're praying beforehand saying, God, I want to hear your word. I want to hear from you. I want it to go into my head. But then Lord, I want Holy Spirit, I want you to take it. And I want you to move it into my heart and change me, change me, make me different. Uh, make me look more like Jesus. And then Lord, help me. What am I supposed to do about it afterwards? Okay. Because it's, I don't just want to hear it and then forget about it. I want to actually change. And so that's what uh, we get out of James there. Just before that, I skipped over, but going back to it, John 17, 17, uh, Jesus saying, sanctify them in truth. Your word is truth. What are we getting from that? Well, sanctified means to be set apart, 
And so make us holy. So Lord, make us holy, sanctify us, set us apart, make us look more like Jesus by your truth. What's your truth? The word of God. Your word is truth. The spirit using the word. So again, God, make me holy. Make me look more like Jesus. Okay, praying these things and thinking these things. And then the last in Isaiah 55, 6 through 11, I'll just, uh, just summarize for you. You can read over it together if you want to. Uh, but it's ultimately at the end, it talks about that the Lord is saying that his word goes forth. And when it goes out, it doesn't return void. It will accomplish its purpose. So even praying, God, accomplish your purpose by your word in my life as I'm reading or in our lives as we're about to read together. Okay. So these principles all would be true when you're praying and about to start uh, studying the word yourself or with other people. So that's where I begin when you're about to, to, to do that. So here's just a bunch of things I have uh, to remember as you go through and you're studying the Bible, okay? So first thing on your list, God wants you to understand. Think about that. He wants you to understand his word. It's not like this mystery thing in one sense that he's trying to hide from you. He wants to reveal it to you. Now, again, there may be different levels or aspects that he reveals to you uh, the first time you read it through versus the fifth time you read that passage versus the 50th time that you read that passage. But he does want to communicate to you. He wants you to understand. Uh, number two, it, it needs to move from the head to the heart to the hands, as we talked about before. So again, not just, oh, I just hear, well, that's an interesting fact. Lord, use it to change me and then help me to apply it to my life. Um, when it comes to meaning and application, the, the meaning of the Bible doesn't change. Okay, so the meaning of the text does not change. Um, one thing that, that said is um, the Bible, it, it can't mean now what it never meant before. Okay, so you can't, you can't take the Bible and say, well, nowadays it means this, but, but back then it meant something different. The application may have changed, but the meaning does not change. Now, it may have kind of multifacets to that meaning, and you have to continue to study and really just dig deep to try to find out all that's going on there. Like, for example, some passages, you read the Psalms, and it, and it, it, it has a meaning in one sense that's talking about David. But there's a deeper meaning, a fuller meaning, that applies to uh, Jesus as the Messiah. So there may be kind of multifaceted meaning, but it's still the same meaning that it meant back when it was written and nowadays. That's why things like, and let me just, just say this up front here, uh, things like uh, the, the mark of the beast is a microchip. No, that's not true, okay? That would have meant that, that those passages had no help or no meaning for Christians for 1,900 years. So things like that, we just got to get that stuff out. That, 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 that does, that's not helpful. Okay, so it, it can't mean now what it, what, it, what it didn't mean back then, okay? And what it, what it meant back then, it can't be different than what it means now. Now, how these things apply, that's going to look different because different people, different cultures, and things of that nature. So, um, the next thing you need to figure is what I'm about to read. What genre is it? Okay, the, the, the Bible is, is, is certainly one book, but it's made up of all these 66 books. And so there's different aspects of it. Just like you're going to read any book, the same uh, principle would apply. If you're going to read poetry, well, you know it's poetry. And so you're going to interpret that a certain way. If it's narrative, like a story, a true story, then you're going to interpret that a certain way. Well, if it's like a song, well, that would have a little bit of a different way of interpreting. Some songs you listen to, they, they don't, they're not literally saying certain things that you're supposed to just... Uh, Take it as, oh, well, my, my, my love for you, it's, it goes from here to the moon and back. Well, what does that even mean? Well, no, that's just saying there's a great love that I have for you. So uh, things like that. So you need to look at the genre. I mean, if, it's, if it has to do, and I have some of these things written down here, but if, it's, if it has to do with prophecy, well, then you need to interpret it that way. That's why people get really confused on like the book of Revelation uh, because they're, they're, they're going in reading it with a, the wrong idea of what genre it is. Um, another aspect would be if it's a letter with these epistles, if it's a letter that Paul's writing, well, realize that it's a letter being sent to a local church. Now, again, it was to them, but it's for all of us still because, again, the Holy Spirit's the, the divine author there. Uh, but as you, as you go to read it, it's a letter written to them, so you need to take that into account as you're interpreting what's, uh, what's being said there. Um, all right, let's continue on with your notes here. Um, context is key, or king, as some people will say. So, so when you look at a verse, you got to see, you can't just read a verse and just say, well, it means this. Well, it may or may not. You need that the context needs to help you uh, understand what a verse means. And this happens all the time, especially with health and wealth, uh, prosperity preachers and things like that. They'll take a verse way out of context. I'm just going to take one. Uh, be still and know that I am God. Well, that, there's truth to being still and knowing that he's God. But what's going on in that passage? Well, it's talking about the Lord demolishing the nations and just ruling. And, and so you got to realize it's probably not the best thing to put on like a, a coffee mug or something of that nature uh, because it's not this just only this kind of sweet and, and gentle idea, but it's actually watch the Lord do his work, including destroy the nations. And you just close your mouth, be still and go, whoa, you are God. 
Okay, so really, you've got a, context is so important. So, what does the verse mean in, 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 the, in the paragraph that it's in? What does that paragraph mean in the chapter? What's going on in the whole chapter? What's going on in that whole section of a book, or the or the let's say the book of Luke? What's going on in the book of Luke? How does that fit into the whole New Testament? And how does it fit into the whole Bible? Uh, we really want to have this idea that Scripture helps us interpret scripture, okay? And so when we're trying to figure out something, we always want to start with the clearest examples of things, and then we, we move to the other passages that are unclear. So if you're reading something like, man, this isn't really clear, you would then have to go and study other passages that talk about it. So there, there's a couple of passages that seem to give this, in, uh, this idea that we can lose our salvation. If you pull only that, that verse out, you could go, man, look, you can lose your salvation. But look at that verse in its context, and the argument going on within that book, and then go to the other very clear passages that certainly say we cannot lose our salvation. So then what is that text saying in light of all these other things? These are some of the stuff we need to be um, considering. Um, let's see. So another thing to ask is, as you're reading through, okay, what's the genre? What's going on? What's the context here? But is it, is it describing something that's taking place? Or is it prescribing something you should do or forbidding something that you, forbidding you to do uh, for something you should not do? So you need to ask the question because sometimes there's just uh, uh, it's just describing something that's taking place and we start to apply that to our lives and we really shouldn't be. There may be principles that we would pull out of that description, but it's not as clear as simply saying, you know, for all Christians all times, do this or, or don't do that. Um, so, uh, you know, like we'll just say you know, committing adultery or lying. Well, that's that's prescribing that we're, we're, we're not supposed to lie, that we're not supposed to lie, so, or commit adultery. Well, that's, that's going to be throughout, and that's going to be clear. But some of the events that goes on in Jesus' life, or the nation of Israel, or with the apostles, some of that's describing what's taking place, and we, we need to be careful of taking that and saying, well, this is what everyone should do, or this is how it's always going to be, because this is what it says in the Bible. Again, was it prescribing or describing something? Um, what else do we have on your notes here? Um, I already said about letting Scripture help us interpret Scripture. Uh, what are the principles of each passage? Um, so look for quotes and allusions. So when you're reading, especially New Testament, a lot of times we'll, we'll allude back to the Old Testament or even quote the Old Testament or maybe even quote other places in the New Testament. And so what we need to see is we need to, when the, when the author does that, we need to go to those verses and then read in context what's going on and why is Paul using that, that quote from the Old Testament. Well, he's trying to teach us something. So we need to go back and take the time to read that. So as you're studying together, as you're studying by yourself, and you start reading, if there's uh, allusions to the Old Testament, then you need to go back and try to find those or direct quotes, go back and read. So that way you can, it helps you understand what argument's being made. Um, let's see, let's see, let's see. Study Bibles, let me just say this. Study Bibles, commentaries, cross-references in your Bibles. These things are very helpful, but also remember that they're not the Word of God. So these are people's opinions of how these things are connected. And now if it's a direct quote from the Old Testament, it shows you that in your Bible, that's very helpful. Uh, but, you know, even your study Bibles, be very careful about jumping down too quickly to see what they say about it. John MacArthur or um, David Jeremiah, whoever you like to read. You know, just be careful on going down right away. Let the Spirit teach you. Read over a passage. Let me say this. Don't don't just read once and then move on. Maybe choose a smaller amount and read and read it again and read it again and read it again and read it a little bit later in the day and listen to it in the car with the dwell app or whatever it is. Don't just quickly go through and read it once and be done. Rarely are you going to catch everything that's being said there. Um, let's see. Remember that chapters and verses, those were not in the original uh, manuscripts. So we have those. Those came along later to help us find you know, different aspects of the Bible. Oh, I'm going to go to Psalm 23 or uh, Luke 18 or whatever it is. But realize that those were put in later. So don't let those divisions with chapters and verses confuse you or make you kind of you take a strong stand on how you're going to interpret a passage uh, because, well, this chapter ended here and this chapter started here. Just be very careful with that and read and see what the flow is of the argument. A lot of times if you do look in commentaries, uh, scholars who are, are working in the Greek and the Hebrew, they'll say, well, really, this idea, this thought continues through this chapter and into the next chapter. And so uh, just again, that's just a warning of just be careful. Same thing. Uh, I would encourage you to use uh, translations, different translations. Again, remember, we have Greek, uh, Hebrew, a little bit of Aramaic, and that's what the original was, uh, manuscripts were written in. So then what we have are copies, and these are faithful copies of those things, but we have copies of those and then translations of those. And some translations are aiming for more of a word for word. If there were 10 words in the Greek, they're trying to have 10 words in the, in the English. Others are just trying to get the basic idea of what's going on. And so I list in your notes there some of the, some of the, the translations that, we would, that I would recommend to you. Um, again, I, I would argue NASB, ESV, uh, CSB, 
maybe the New King James um, are, are really going to be your best ones, and maybe even King James, especially if you can understand it. But make sure you are reading a translation that you understand. You need to understand what's being said. And then with that, if you want to get a little more depth, well, read some other translations because there may be some phrasings. It doesn't change the meaning of it, but it may add light or give you a little more clarity on what's being said there. Now, again, because when you are, uh, you've heard the phrasing lost in interpretation. Well, when you interpret scripture and you're translating it to, or lost in translation, um, phrasing. When you do translate, there's ideas that, you know, it's just not quite as clear. And that's why pastors and scholars try to work in the Greek and Hebrew and Aramaic in particular, so they can have the, the best idea. And that's what they do when they do these translations. But it's good to read other translations to help uh, fill in some of those may, maybe small gaps or just color that picture in a little bit more. Um, realize, again, I've said before about the, the partial fulfillment. Sometimes you read passages and it's and it, there's, a, there's a, a fulfillment or an idea of what's going on right there, but there's a bigger way that it's being used. Um, so like the book of Jonah would be a great example. You read the book of Jonah and it has its own story, uh, but we see later in the New Testament that it has more meaning that you don't really see until later, and Jesus helps us see that in particular. Um, let's see. Keep in mind that... Um, the Bible is ultimately and primarily about God and what God has done, what God is doing, and what God will do. It's, it's, it's not primarily about you or humans, and we're not the heroes of the story. Uh, David's not the hero. Uh, Solomon's not the hero. Uh, Moses, really, he's not the hero. God's the hero of the story, and he's the main focus of the story. So we always got to keep that in mind. Okay, uh, Jesus in Luke 24, you can have that on your notes there too. Jesus says that all the, the Old Testament Psalms, uh, the, the, the writings, the law, they, they speak about him. So if you're interpreting things and you don't, you're not mentioning Jesus or how this connects to Jesus, uh, then you're missing the point. And so we want to make sure uh, that we are focused on that. There's a lot more I could say on Bible interpretation or um, when we're studying scripture, but uh, those are just things that you need to keep in mind. So go over these notes and keep these things in mind when you're going and reading. So then I have five questions. This is the really, really, really practical side of this. Uh, five questions to ask as you study a passage, right? So again, they're on your notes. Um, what does this text teach about God? God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. And what does this teach me about Satan, angels, demons, myself, humans? Ask that question as you read the passage. Next would be, what stands out to you? So you read it and go, man, what, what jumps out at you? Well, something you didn't see before. What, what do you see now? And you do this in your groups, too. You can ask this of the other people that you're with. Um, what questions does this raise in your mind? What, what, what does this make you think about? What does this remind you of in the Bible or other places? Or just, what is this you know, are you confused about something? What, what, what questions does it bring to your mind? Um, not a, a really good one, my favorite, I would say, is, uh, why is this in the Bible? Why is this in the Bible? And God, why did you send me this text message today? Why did you have me read this today? And then lastly, what am I supposed to do with this? Like, Lord, what do you, how am I supposed to change my life? What am I supposed to do differently? So those five questions are, are, are what I would encourage you to, to, to really use as you go through study, keeping those other things in mind. So last, real quick, last couple of minutes, here's what I'm going to do. Uh, Luke chapter 19, uh, turn to Luke chapter 19, beginning in verse 1. Luke 19 verse 1. And this is Jesus and Zacchaeus. So I'm going to do this for you with Zacchaeus, okay? So I would, I'm going to start. Um, Father, please uh, bless this time for me. Lord, uh, Holy Spirit, teach me, open my eyes, help me to see what is in this passage for me today, and, and help me to apply it to my life, Lord. Uh, change me to look more like Jesus, and uh, help me, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so I go and I'm going to read. I know this is in the Gospel of Luke, so I know it's New Testament. Uh, I know this is telling stories, a narrative of what's happened. And so this isn't like a, a parable or anything like that. So I know that it's, it's there. So this is describing something that's taken place versus prescribing. And so let me, uh, again, context-wise, Jesus is in the middle of talking about um, the, the kingdom is coming. And he's talking about these various uh, parables. We see the, the, the story of the rich young ruler and how difficult it is to follow God. Uh, Jesus just had healed somebody, a blind beggar. And now verse 19, uh, chapter 19, verse 1. He entered Jericho and was passing through. Okay, Jesus comes into Jericho, passing through. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. Okay, I'm not Zacchaeus. That's not my name. This is Zacchaeus, the story with him. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. And he was seeking to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd, he could not because he was small in stature. So he ran ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was about to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said, Zacchaeus, 
hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all grumbled. He has gone and to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and I have defrauded, and if I have defrauded any one of anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today, listen to this, today salvation has come to this house, since he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. Okay. Going through this describing a story, normally what I would do, but for the sake of time I won't do it, I would read through again. Okay, try to read through it again. All right. Lord, what are you teaching me? So I'm going to take those five questions, knowing everything else that's there, and kind of work through it. What does this text teach me about God, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit? Well, this is about the Son, obviously. Jesus is, 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 is the key person here. Well, apparently, one, Jesus is going into a town, so he's moving around. What else do I see? He apparently knows Zacchaeus. He's compassionate. He knows that Zacchaeus wants to see him, and so he tells him to come. And then even though Zacchaeus is known as a tax collector, and I know from other passages that that's a bad thing, he still says, I'm going to your house today, Zacchaeus, because he knows that Zacchaeus wants to be with him. So he goes, and we see that the other people get upset. What's this teaching me about other people? Well, they think that they're better than Zacchaeus, and they don't think that Jesus should be with those who are sinners. But Jesus says that he'll go be with Zacchaeus. What else do I see about Zacchaeus? Well, I see that he wants to be with the Lord. He gets to be with the Lord, and then he actually changes. Look what it says. Behold, Lord... The half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I've defrauded anyone, I restore it fourfold. I see something happening in Zacchaeus' life. I see that he's changing after being with Jesus. And Jesus then says that salvation has come because he really believes in Jesus and he's changing, right? So I'm seeing these things. So what's standing out to me that that maybe I I didn't see before um, in this passage I would say probably verse 9, he says, Today salvation has come to this house, since he also is a son of Abraham. What does that mean? I didn't know that, I didn't remember that that said that. Son of Abraham, meaning that he's a son of faith, perhaps Jewish and from the line of Abraham, but knowing other passages in the Bible, he's a son of faith, promised child, if you will. Um, But it could just be that he's from the line of Abraham. That's something I didn't notice before. Uh, what questions does this raise in my mind? Well, he talks about the poor, and he certainly talks about uh, helping the poor and giving back. And so what does repentance look like? What should it look like in my life with whatever I'm struggling with? The other thing is, uh, question I have is, um, he calls Zacchaeus by name. That's interesting. And what I love seeing here, too, is that uh, notice that he was a short man, but God made a way for him to get to Jesus with the tree. That's kind of cool. Did You know, where did that come from? Question in my mind. Why is this in the Bible? Well, a couple different things jump out at me. One, it shows Jesus and his care and compassion. It it shows that the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. He's concerned with the lost. And if the lost will respond to him and they will go to try to be with Jesus, he will make a way for them to get to him. Um... I think it also shows that there are those that can have um, this mentality that they're better than other people and that Jesus doesn't want to be with sinners. No, we're all sinners. He does want to to come and and seek and save all of us. Um, It shows what true repentance looks like. Zacchaeus, tax collector, money is the biggest thing in his life, and he becomes very generous after meeting Jesus. So it shows repentance. Um, A lot more you could probably, you guys could probably see in this as well, and that's what you would do. You would ask one another, what do you see in this? What's going on? So what I'm saying this, and then what am I supposed to do with this? Well, as I read through this, part of, part of what I see is I need to remember that Jesus is kind. I need to remember that Jesus provides a way. If I, if I seek to spend time with Jesus, he's going to provide a way to do it, even if he had to plant a tree a hundred years before. He'll make sure that he works it, that I can, I can be with him. I also notice that Zacchaeus responds. When Jesus says do it, Zacchaeus responds. My own life application, Jesus says do something, I need to do it. I read things in his word, I need to respond in obedience. 
I need to ask the question, what does repentance look like in my life? And then I would ask in verse 6 as well, when, when Zacchaeus hurries down and goes to Jesus, um, you know, he said, we'll go back to verse 5 and 6 there. Uh, and when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. There's a joyfulness in receiving Jesus into his home. Am I joyful to receive Jesus and his word, or do I do it out of obligation? Zacchaeus, there's no obligation here. He wants it. He wants Jesus. Um, I, and I need to remember that the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost, and that's the mission, and that's what I need to be doing. So these are some examples of just working through it uh, off the cuff here. Uh, maybe you have some other things that you could uh, see or that spoke to you in that passage. So my encouragement to you as a group now is to take kind of these same things, these five questions or, or some others that maybe your group leader has, um, and, and these principles, and you're going to study a passage together now, and, and do this very thing, asking one another, working through it, and seeing and, uh, what, it, what, what God shows you, the Spirit shows you uh, from this. And hopefully that will give you uh, just more uh, excitement and ability in your self-study of the Word and when you're doing this kind of Word ministry with other people. All right, I love you guys. I hope you have a blessed day and uh, evening, and I uh, look forward to getting together again soon. Bye.